atrocities in the Congo Free State, genocide. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the Congo Free State, under the rule of King Leopold II of Belgium, witnessed a dark chapter in human history. This period was marred by a series of atrocities, labor abuses, and human rights violations, with the extraction of natural rubber for export serving as a catalyst for immense suffering. The impact on the Congolese population, combined with disease, famine, and violent coercion, led to a significant decline in numbers, although the exact magnitude remains a subject of historical debate. This tragic history of the Congo Free State is a reminder of the complex and often devastating consequences of colonialism. The period from 1885 to 1908 in the Congo Free State, which is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo, was marked by a series of atrocities and human rights abuses. These horrors were largely associated with the labor practices implemented to extract natural rubber for export under the absolute rule of King Leopold II of the Belgians. The impact of these actions, combined with epidemic diseases, famine, and disruptions to traditional society, resulted in a significant decline in the Congolese population during that time. Estimates of the magnitude of this population decline vary, with modern estimates ranging from 1.5 million to 13 million people. At the Berlin Conference of 1884 to 1885, European powers allocated most of the Congo Basin to a philanthropic organization supposedly led by King Leopold II. The territory under his control was massive, exceeding 2.6 million square kilometers. Initially, the colony proved financially unprofitable, leading to ongoing financial problems. However, the demand for natural rubber in the 1890s brought about a significant change. To facilitate rubber extraction and export, all vacant land in the Congo was nationalized, and the majority was granted to private companies as concessions. The companies were given free reign to exploit these concessions between 1891 and 1906, leading to the use of forced labor and violent coercion to maximize profits. The forced public, the free state's military force, enforced these labor policies, and individual workers who refused to participate in rubber collection could be killed and entire villages were often raised. Disease was the primary direct cause of the population decline in the Congo Free State, with social disruption from the atrocities exacerbating the situation. Epidemics such as African sleeping sickness, smallpox, swine influenza, and amoebic dysentery devastated the indigenous populations. In 1901 alone, it was estimated that 500,000 Congolese died from sleeping sickness. Disease, famine, and violence combined to reduce the birth rate while increasing excess deaths. One particularly gruesome aspect of the atrocities was the severing of workers' hands, which gained international notoriety. Forced public soldiers were sometimes required to bring back the hands of their victims to account for the ammunition they used. These details were documented by Christian missionaries working in the Congo and led to public outrage in the United Kingdom, Belgium, the United States, and other countries. An international campaign against the Congo Free State began in 1890, gaining momentum after 1900, primarily under the leadership of British activist E. D. Morell. In response to international pressure, on November 15, 1908, the government of Belgium annexed the Congo Free State, forming the Belgian Congo and ending many of the systems responsible for the abuses. The magnitude of the population decline during this period is still the subject of historical debate, and there is ongoing discussion regarding whether these atrocities constitute genocide. In 2020, King Philippe of Belgium expressed his regret to the government of Congo for the acts of violence and cruelty inflicted during the rule of the Congo Free State but did not explicitly mention King Leopold's role. Some activists criticized him for not offering a full apology. The legacy of this period continues to be a topic of discussion and remembrance in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Belgium, and around the world. The establishment of the Congo Free State, a private colony ruled by King Leopold II of Belgium, was driven by Leopold's personal ambition to create a colonial empire that would enhance Belgian prestige. Even before ascending to the Belgian throne in 1865, Leopold tirelessly lobbied influential Belgian politicians for support in creating a colonial empire, initially in the Far East or Africa. However, colonization was met with skepticism and unpopularity in Belgium. 
Many considered it a risky and costly endeavor with uncertain benefits for the country. Leopold's efforts to persuade politicians yielded little success, which prompted him to search for a colony independently. He became interested in Africa, particularly the reports from Central Africa, and began supporting prominent explorers, including Henry Morton Stanley. To facilitate his colonial ambitions, Leopold established the International African Association, ostensibly a charitable organization with the mission of bringing humanitarian assistance and civilization to the native populations. In the Berlin Conference of 1884-85, European leaders officially recognized Leopold's control over the Congo Free State, encompassing an area of 2,350,000 square kilometers. The recognition was based on the premise that the Congo Free State would serve as a free trade area and a buffer state between the British and French spheres of influence in Africa. Within the Free State, King Leopold II exercised total personal control, maintaining minimal delegation of authority to subordinates. African chiefs played a role in administering the territory, implementing government orders within their communities. However, the presence of the Free State in the claimed territory was patchy. The administration was concentrated in small, widely dispersed stations, each controlling limited hinterland. In 1900, the Congo Free State had only about 3,000 white inhabitants, with just half of them being Belgian. The Free State consistently faced a shortage of administrative staff and officials, numbering between 700 and 1,500 during that period. In the early years of the Free State, much of the administration's efforts were directed toward consolidating its control through military campaigns against African groups on the periphery who resisted the Free State's rule. These groups included the tribes around the Quango region in the southwest and the Wele region in the northeast. Some of the violence during this period was attributed to African groups leveraging colonial support to settle scores or white administrators acting without state approval. The economic and administrative situation in the Congo Free State was characterized by a focus on profitability, particularly for King Leopold II and the investors involved in the colony. Financial stability was a recurring issue, as early reliance on ivory exports did not generate the expected revenues, and the colonial administration frequently faced financial difficulties, coming close to default on multiple occasions. However, a significant turning point occurred in the 1890s with the boom in demand for natural rubber. This marked a transformation in the Free State's economic prospects. The Free State began to exploit Congolese males as forced labor to collect wild rubber, which was then exported to Europe and North America. This shift in the economy led to substantial profits, with rubber exports increasing from 580 to 3,740 tons between 1895 and 1900. To facilitate economic extraction from the free state, a land division system known as the Domain System, Regime Dominial, was introduced in 1891. Under this system, all vacant land, including forests and uncultivated areas, was declared uninhabited and thus fell under the possession of the state. This effectively placed many of the Congo's valuable resources, especially rubber and ivory, under direct colonial ownership. Concessions were allocated to private companies, further enhancing economic exploitation. For instance, the Societe Anversoise received 160,000 square kilometers in the north, while the Anglo-Belgian India Rubber Company, ABR, was granted a comparable territory in the south. Smaller concessions were also given to the company Du Katanga and Company de Grands Lacs in the south and east, respectively. King Leopold retained personal control over 250,000 square kilometers known as the Crown Domain, Domain de la Couronne, which was added to the territory he already controlled under the private domain, Domain Prive. This economic system proved highly profitable, and ABR, for example, achieved a turnover of over 100% on its initial investment in a single year. King Leopold personally benefited immensely making 70 million Belgian francs in profit from the system between 1896 and 1905. The Free State's concession system served as a model for other colonial regimes, notably those in neighboring French Congo, and contributed to the economic exploitation of the Congolese interior during this period. The red rubber system, associated with the Congo Free State, was a labor policy designed to maximize the extraction of rubber, which constituted the majority of the Free State's revenues. 
Critics decry this system for the atrocities and abuses it engendered. Under this policy, labor was demanded by the administration as a form of taxation, creating what some have called a slave society. The free state's financial dependence on rubber exports led to a heavy reliance on forcibly mobilizing Congolese labor for rubber collection. The state employed black officials, known as capitas, to organize local labor. However, the centrally enforced demands for rubber were often set arbitrarily, without consideration for the number of laborers or their well-being. In the concessionary territories, where private companies had purchased concessions from the free state administration, these companies could employ virtually any measures they wished to increase production and profits without state interference. The lack of a developed bureaucracy to oversee commercial methods created an atmosphere of informality that facilitated abuses. The treatment of laborers, especially the duration of their service, was not regulated by law and was left to the discretion of officials on the ground. Some companies, such as ABR and the Anversois, were particularly notorious for their harsh treatment of Congolese workers. Regions under the control of these companies were described as veritable hells on earth. Rubber harvesters were typically compensated with cheap items like cloth, beads, salt, or knives. In some instances, customary chiefs who ordered their subjects to gather rubber were rewarded with slaves. For those who refused to supply their labor, coercion and repression were employed. Dissenters were beaten or whipped with the chicot, hostages were taken to ensure prompt rubber collection, and punitive expeditions were sent to destroy villages that refused to comply. This policy had devastating consequences, leading to the collapse of Congolese economic and cultural life in many areas, as well as the disruption of farming practices. Much of the enforcement of rubber production was carried out by the force public, the colonial military. The force public was initially established in 1885 and recruited soldiers from various regions, contributing to the spread of the Lingala language across the country. Some units, such as the Zappo Zaps, were particularly feared, with reports of cannibalism among their ranks. By 1900, the force public numbered 19,000 men. Additionally, rubber companies often employed their own militias, which worked in collaboration with the force public to enforce their rule. The red rubber system was a brutal chapter in the history of the Congo Free State and endured from the creation of the concession regime in 1891 until 1906 when the concession system was restricted. It was most heavily localized in the Equator, Bandundu, and Kasai regions of the Congo Free State. The brutality and mutilation inflicted upon the Congolese population during the Congo Free State's rule were part of a horrifying chapter in history. The failure to meet rubber collection quotas was met with the most severe punishment, death. To confirm the kill, members of the force public were required to present the severed hands of their victims, as it was feared that the ammunition, imported from Europe at considerable cost, would otherwise be misused for hunting or stockpiled for mutiny. As a result, cut-off hands were, in part, used to meet rubber quotas. This practice is exemplified in the account of a man named Swamp, describing the state official Lyon Fives, who ran a district along the river in the Congo. Fives demanded that soldiers bring him the number of hands cut off by each of them in baskets. Villages that refused to provide rubber were ruthlessly punished, sometimes with their entire population wiped out. Soldiers subjected the Congolese people to unspeakable horrors, making young men kill or rape their own family members. One officer recounted a raid on a protesting village, where the officer ordered the beheading of men and the hanging of women and children in the shape of a cross on the village's palisades. The severed hands, collected and brought to the European post commanders, became the grim symbol of the Congo Free State, serving various purposes. They were used to make up for rubber quota shortfalls and replace people demanded for forced labor gangs. Force public soldiers received bonuses based on the number of hands they collected. While in theory, each right hand represented a killing in practice to save ammunition, some soldiers cheated by merely cutting off the hand and leaving the victim to live or die. Survivors often described how they played dead, not moving even when their hands were severed, and waited until the soldiers left before seeking help. Some soldiers could shorten their service term by presenting more hands than their peers, which led to widespread mutilations and dismemberment. It is important to note that while dismemberment of the living did occur, it may not have been as systemic as initially presented. 
Historians have suggested that most cases of dismemberment were caused by soldiers who believed they were severing the hands of dead victims, but who were, in fact, still alive. Leopold II reportedly disapproved of dismemberment, not out of humanitarian concerns, but because it harmed his economic interests, as hands were seen as a valuable commodity for meeting rubber quotas. His quote, cut off hands, that's idiotic. I'd cut off all the rest of them, but not hands. That's the one thing I need in the Congo, highlights the economic motivation behind the horrific practices during his rule. The exploitation and brutality within the Congo Free State extended to various forms of oppression and coercion, beyond the forced labor and mutilation described earlier. Prisons and hostage-taking One method used to compel workers to collect rubber involved taking wives and family members hostage. Although Leopold II never officially proclaimed this as a policy, authorities in the Free State supplied a manual to each station in the Congo, instructing how to take hostages to pressure local chiefs. Hostages could be of any age or gender, even including the chiefs themselves. Each state or company station maintained a stockade for imprisoning these hostages. Agents from companies like ABR would imprison chiefs when villages failed to meet their rubber quotas. The conditions in these prisons were deplorable, and death rates were alarmingly high in some, recording 3 to 10 prisoner deaths per day. Wars and rebellions, violence in the free state was also closely linked to wars and rebellions. Native states and territories that refused to acknowledge colonial authority, such as Msiri's Yet Kingdom, the Zonda Federation, and areas under Tipa Tip, a notorious slave trader, were defeated by the force public with brutal tactics during the Congo Arab War. In 1895, a military mutiny among the Batatella and Kasai led to a four year insurgency, marked by extreme brutality and a high casualty count. Famine, the presence of rubber companies, like ABR, exacerbated the impact of natural disasters, such as famine and disease. Abir's tax collection system compelled men to leave their villages to collect rubber, leaving no labor force to clear new fields for planting. As a result, Women were left to farm depleted fields, further reducing yields. The problem was compounded by company centuries stealing crops and farm animals. Famine and food shortages affected several regions and led to dire circumstances. Child colonies. Leopold II approved the establishment of child colonies where orphaned Congolese children were kidnapped and sent to schools run by Catholic missionaries. In these schools, they were taught to work or become soldiers. More than 50% of the children sent to these schools died from disease, and thousands more perished during the forced marches to the colonies. These child colonies were the only schools funded by the state. Labor of non-Congolese The exploitation extended beyond indigenous Congolese. The free state imported 540 Chinese laborers to work on railways, with 300 of them either dying or leaving their posts. Additionally, people from the Caribbean and other African countries were brought in to work on the railway construction. Tragically, 3,600 laborers died within the first two years of construction due to railroad accidents, lack of shelter, flogging, hunger, and disease. These additional forms of oppression and cruelty further illustrate the extensive and deeply disturbing human rights abuses that occurred in the Congo Free State during this period. Cannibalism was distressingly prevalent in parts of the Free State when it was established, and the colonial administration, in some instances, did little to suppress or even tolerated it among its auxiliary troops and allies. The evidence of cannibalism within the Free State is deeply disturbing. During the Congo Arab War, 1892-1894 reports surfaced of widespread cannibalization of the bodies of defeated combatants by the Batatella allies of the Belgian commander Francis Danis. These reports shed light on the brutal nature of the conflict. Punitive expeditions and cannibal feasts When free state officials carried out punitive expeditions against villages that were either unwilling or unable to meet the government's exorbitant rubber quota. They often turned a blind eye to arbitrary killings and cannibal feasts celebrated by native soldiers that sometimes followed. In some cases, captives, including infants and elderly women, were handed over to soldiers or local allies, implicitly or explicitly allowing them to kill and eat them. Lack of interest in stopping cannibal customs. Many free state officials appeared to have little interest in halting cannibal customs. 
Guy Burroughs, for example, reported that he and his colleagues were aware that slaves were being sold to provide meat to people on the other side of the river near the Mongala River. However, neither the state nor the private companies operating in the area took any action to suppress this trade. Their focus remained exclusively on profitable rubber extraction. Similar reports exist for other regions. Even when a white official intervened to rescue a young slave boy from becoming the main course of a cannibal banquet, the local corporal had been aware of the planned feast but had not considered it noteworthy. As such practices had reportedly occurred in neighboring villages without intervention from white men at the post. These accounts reveal a deeply troubling aspect of the Congo Free State's history, where not only was rampant exploitation occurring, but the authorities, in some cases, allowed or ignored practices of cannibalism, even among their own troops and allies. The population decline in the Congo Free State during King Leopold II's rule was a complex and devastating phenomenon with multiple causes, including both direct and indirect effects of colonial rule. Direct Causes Violence and Murder Historians generally agree that violence and murder contributed to the population decline, but the extent of its impact is debated. Estimates suggest that violence and murder accounted for a relatively small percentage of the total deaths, with one local study estimating it at less than 5% of the population. Disease Diseases imported by various sources, including Arab traders, European colonists, and African porters, played a significant role in the population decline. Diseases such as smallpox, sleeping sickness, amoebic dysentery, venereal diseases, syphilis and gonorrhea, and swine influenza had devastating effects on the Congolese population. Sleeping sickness, in particular, was rampant and had a high mortality rate, with an estimated 500,000 deaths from sleeping sickness in 1901. Food shortages and malnutrition the disruption caused by the forced labor policies and rubber extraction led to food shortages and malnutrition, further weakening the Congolese population's immunity to diseases. Indirect Causes Falling birth rate It is widely believed that birth rates fell during this period, leading to a decline in the population's growth rate relative to the natural death rate. The exact reasons for this fall in birth rates are complex but it could be attributed to the disruption of traditional family structures and the physical and psychological stress placed on the population due to the harsh working conditions. Disruption of Rural Communities The forced labor policies and the extraction of rubber disrupted African rural communities, which may have helped spread diseases further. Pre-colonial Population Fluctuation It's important to note that pre-colonial African societies often experienced high birth and death rates, leading to significant natural population fluctuations over time. The impact of colonial rule exacerbated these existing fluctuations. In summary, the population decline in the Congo Free State resulted from a combination of factors, including violence, diseases, falling birth rates, food shortages, and the disruption of traditional communities. These factors interacted in a devastating way, leading to a significant reduction in the Congolese population during this dark chapter in history. Estimates of the population decline in the Congo Free State during King Leopold II's rule vary widely due to the absence of reliable demographic sources, the unsubstantiated numbers mentioned by contemporaries, and the lack of census records from the time. The estimates range from as low as 1.5 million to as high as 13 million making it difficult to determine the exact death toll. Here are some of the estimates and perspectives. Contemporary observers. Some contemporary observers suggested that the population of the Congo decreased by half during this period. Edmund D. Morell estimated that the Congo Free State had about 20 million people at the beginning of Leopold's control. Historians' estimates. Various historians and researchers have provided their estimates of the population decline. Estimates from these sources include Roger Casement, a population fall of 3 million, considered an underestimate. Peter Forbath, at least 5 million deaths. John Gunther, a minimum estimate of 5 million deaths and a maximum of 8 million. Raphael Lemkin, posited that 75% of the population was killed. Modern demographic estimates. J.P. Sanderson estimated the population in 1885 at around 10 to 15 million people. In 2020, he proposed several scenarios, 
suggesting that the most likely scenario is a population decline of 1.5 million people during the Congo Free State period. Adam Hotschild and Jan Van Zyna Hotschild and Van Zyna cite recent independent lines of investigation that examine local sources, including police records, religious records, oral traditions, and genealogies. These sources generally agree with the assessment of a 1919 Belgian government commission, which estimated that roughly half the population perished during the Free State period. Based on numbers from the rubber provinces, these approaches suggest a rough estimate of a population decline by 10 million. Isidore Ndewel Ainzim Ndewel Ainzim initially claimed that 13 million died, though he later revised this number downwards to 10 million. Lewis and Stangers They emphasized the lack of reliable demographic data, particularly at the start of Leopold's control, and questioned attempts to quantify population losses. It's important to note that there is ongoing debate and discussion among historians about the accuracy and reliability of these estimates. Some argue for higher figures, while others emphasize the lack of concrete data from the time and the challenges in arriving at a precise number. The wide range of estimates reflects the complexities of studying this dark chapter in the Congo's history and the difficulty in quantifying the human cost of King Leopold II's rule. The international awareness and subsequent investigation into the atrocities in the Congo Free State played a crucial role in bringing an end to King Leopold II's brutal rule. Here is an overview of the key events and individuals involved in this effort. George Washington Williams In 1890, American George Washington Williams published an open letter to Leopold, describing the abuses he had witnessed and coining the phrase, Crimes Against Humanity. This letter marked one of the earliest international protests against the Congo Free State. Stokes' affair, the public's interest in the abuses in the Congo Free State grew significantly from 1895, particularly following the Stokes' affair, which involved reports of mutilations and other brutalities. These reports reached the European and American public, sparking discussions about the Congo question. Commission for the Protection of Natives To address growing public opinion, Leopold established a commission for the protection of natives, composed of foreign missionaries. However, this move did little to bring substantive reform. E. D. Morel and the Congo Reform Association in the United Kingdom, E. D. Morel led a campaign against the Congo Free State's abuses after 1900. His book, Red Rubber 1906, helped raise awareness among the masses. Notable figures who joined the campaign included authors Mark Twain, Joseph Conrad, and Arthur Conan Doyle, as well as Belgian socialist Emile van der Velt. Roger Casement's investigation British consul Roger Casement toured the Congo to investigate the extent of the abuses. He delivered a report in December, and a revised version was sent to the Free State Authorities in February 1904. Efforts to Combat Disease to counter British criticism and preserve the labor force, Leopold promoted efforts to combat disease and invited experts from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine to assist. However, these efforts were seen as attempts to improve the Congo's image rather than substantive reforms. Congo Reform Association, this campaign group, led by E. D. Morel and others, aimed to end the excesses of the Free State and pressured Belgium to officially annex the colony avoiding potential conflicts between European powers. Commission of Inquiry In 1904, a commission of inquiry, appointed by the Free State regime, confirmed the stories of atrocities, further increasing pressure on the Belgian government to take action. Annexation and creation of the Belgian Congo As a direct result of the international campaign, Belgium formally annexed the territory in 1908, creating the Belgian Congo. This led to improved conditions for the indigenous population and the partial suppression of forced labor. While the abuses in the Congo Free State had a profound impact on international opinion and led to the end of Leopold's personal rule, it's important to acknowledge that the transition to the Belgian Congo marked a new chapter in the country's history, with its own set of challenges and complexities. The question of whether the atrocities committed during King Leopold II's rule in the Congo Free State should be characterized as genocide has been a subject of historical debate and controversy. While there is widespread agreement that the actions resulted in a significant loss of life and immense suffering, historians and scholars have differing perspectives on whether the term genocide is an appropriate label. Here are some key points of the historiographical debate. 
Definition of Genocide The term genocide, as defined by the United Nations in 1948, refers to acts committed with the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. Some historians argue that the free state atrocities do not fit this strict definition, as there is no clear evidence of a deliberate, systematic plan to exterminate a specific population group. Death Toll and Intent Many historians acknowledge that extermination was not the explicit policy of the free state. Rather, the extreme loss of life resulted from brutal economic exploitation, forced labor, and harsh conditions. There is debate over whether the significant death toll should be considered an unintended consequence of exploitative policies. Use of terminology Some scholars and observers have used terms like Congo Holocaust to describe the scale of the suffering and death in the free state. While this language emphasizes the severity of the atrocities, it does not necessarily imply the specific intent required for genocide. Criticism of Terminology Critics argue that comparisons between the free state atrocities and the Holocaust or other genocides can be misleading and create confusion over terminology. Some suggest that the use of the term genocide should be based on a careful examination of historical evidence. Differing Perspectives There is no single, definitive view on whether the free state atrocities should be labeled as genocide. Historians and scholars hold a range of opinions on this issue, and the debate continues. Ultimately, the debate over whether the events in the Congo Free State constitute genocide highlights the complex nature of historical interpretation and the importance of precise definitions in the study of mass atrocities. It is clear, however, that the suffering and death inflicted upon the Congolese population during this period were of an extraordinary scale and tragic consequence, regardless of the terminology used. The legacy of King Leopold II's rule in the Congo Free State is marked by a complex and often contentious history. Here are some key aspects of this legacy. Labor shortage. The severe population decline during Leopold's reign left the subsequent colonial government with a significant labor shortage. This labor shortage required mass migrations to provide workers for emerging businesses and industries in the Congo. Public debate. The atrocities committed in the Congo during Leopold's rule generated public debate and condemnation. The international community, particularly in the United Kingdom and the United States, played a significant role in exposing the abuses and raising awareness about the situation. Legacy of Leopold Leopold's legacy has been a subject of ongoing debate. Despite the atrocities, statues and monuments of Leopold were erected in Belgium during the 1930s, and the Belgian government celebrated his accomplishments. However, his legacy remains controversial, and public sentiment in Belgium shifted over time. Renewed Debate the release of Adam Hochschild's book King Leopold's Ghost in 1999 reignited the debate about Leopold's role in the Congo. The book brought the atrocities to the forefront of public consciousness, both in Belgium and internationally. Statue Controversy The presence of statues of Leopold II in Belgium and the Congo has been a point of contention. In recent years, some statues were relocated or vandalized reflecting the ongoing debate about whether public monuments should honor individuals associated with such a brutal colonial legacy. Royal Regret In June 2020, on the 60th anniversary of Congolese independence, King Philippe of Belgium expressed his deepest regret for the acts of violence and cruelty committed during the colonial period, including the Congo Free State. However, his statement did not explicitly mention Leopold's role in the atrocities leading to criticism from some activists who called for a full apology. The legacy of King Leopold II's rule in the Congo remains a topic of historical reflection and public discussion, with ongoing calls for accountability, acknowledgement of the past, and debates about how to memorialize this complex and controversial chapter of history.